Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking more about parallel computing, that is using perhaps clustered computers or multiprocessor systems to more efficiently solve problems of CFD. We'll be looking at a number of concepts that are important for program design. If you can learn to generalize and parallelize simple programs, then you can begin the task of parallelizing a larger and more complicated CFD code. We will not be showing the parallelization techniques used in a full-scale code, but they're really the same for smaller codes, just at a larger scale. In our previous class, we looked at an overview and introduction for parallel computing. We looked at the particular computers they run on, the memory architectures, and of course, how they're used in our society today. Let's look at a brief outline. This class is very simple and straightforward. First, we'll talk about the general philosophy and design of programs that are going to be run in parallel. This is usually based on some initial serial program which is validated and working in a way we want. We want to take that program and design it and recompile it so that it can be run on multiple processing units within a computer or series of computers. Then we'll look at a few examples. For example, the wave equation, heat equation, and some simpler problems just to demonstrate how domains might be decomposed, and of course we can execute our programs in parallel. And we'll look at some particular source codes for these problems. Let's first turn our attention to the design of the programs. Designing and developing parallel programs is a very, very manual process traditionally. Today there are some tools to try and automate this process, which we'll be mentioning in a few minutes. But it's really up to the programmer to try and identify parts of the program that can be parallelized. Just like a programmer would design the initial program and validate it, they would then re-examine the program and initiate some parallelization commands through calls of libraries, typically. Very often, this is done manually for parallel codes, and as you can imagine, it's very time-consuming and complex. Typically, the design and parallelization of a serial code can take as almost as much time as writing the original code. It's also error-prone, and therefore, many attempts have to be made to run the code and validate that this parallelism is implemented correctly. This is seen as an iterative process, and on a cluster computer, there might be some small number of nodes and processors reserved for debugging and developing codes in parallel, especially on that system. It should also be mentioned that Compilers and particular large-scale clusters are often a little bit picky about their source code, and each particular computer might need small adjustments to the source code for it to be run properly. So for example, if I have four different clusters from four different vendors, I might have to have four sets of different compiler flags and some small adjustments within the code, source code itself to get it running properly. There are some general tools that have been emerging to try and take serial codes and convert them to parallel codes. For CFD, this has not been too successful, and still these types of codes are run and programmed manually. Now, a parallelizing compiler, that is the compiler that takes the source code and creates object codes and, of course, assembles it through the process of an executable, can be categorized really in two ways. One is fully automatic in that it will try and parallelize the code automatically, use its own directives. I don't really recommend doing this for a new person, uh, learning to parallelize codes in parallel computing, of course, because it's just automated. If you really want to understand it, you'll have to go down at the level of the source code for each line and parallelize it using so-called compiler directives and calling libraries for parallelism. We'll be mentioning those soon. The most popular one today is called MPI, the Message Passing Interface. Designing programs is the most important thing before one starts programming. Before any code is laid down or a code is converted to parallel, I really suggest you sit down and think carefully about the strategy. What type of problem are you solving and how is it going to be in parallel? What's the most efficient approach and what kind of system are you writing this parallelization for? These should all be taken into account before a single line of code is written to modify a code from serial to parallel. In engineering in general, the most difficult and most important part of the process of design is understand the problem. All too often, even senior and experienced engineers are tempted to start working without fully understanding what is trying to be done. I suggest carefully thinking about what your objective is and understanding the problem you're trying to be solving first. The first step, too, is also to understand the serial code. And if you've written your own serial code, you should, of course. But it's very often that in teams of programmers creating CFD codes, one would have to try and understand the whole code before it can be paralyzed. This will take some time also, especially if you're a new member on the team. 
So another important factor would to you be to understand even if the problem can be parallelized. So some problems, that is algorithms implemented in the computers, cannot be parallelized. This is unfortunate. But maybe there's many different cases the serial program might operate on. Then it can be run, of course, in serial on many different processors in parallel. That is, the program itself is not running in parallel. It's being executed in serial. It just might have different inputs in that is the files it's reading to run. And this way, many different cases and studies can be run simultaneously on a large system, but just not truly in a real parallel fashion. The code is running in parallel on separate processors in a serial fashion. One example of parallel uh, implementation in other fields might be simple toll booths. For example, in this very wide expressway, and I'm sure many of you have seen these in perhaps Orlando if you're from Florida, can see that they've actually parallelized the process of, of course, charging fees and doing inspections. They could do this all through one lane and cause a major backup, or they could do this in parallel like in this fashion. It's a great analogy for the idea of taking a serial code to a parallel code with perhaps road traffic. There's a number of factors to take into account when designing programs. The major ones listed here and in the next few pages will be the cost of communications, latency, bandwidth, and of course, visibility of communications, which is more about the programming model and user. The cost of communications re refers to the idea that it takes time for one processor to communicate with another processor. It takes time to move memory through the computer. It takes time to read and write data to files, which are eventually in practice sent through the high-speed network also. This is true pretty much on all parallelization of computers, especially those that uses a distributed memory approach, which is the most common, as you saw in our previous class, on the breakdown of types of memory models for high-performance computers. So this inter-task communication is always viewed as overhead. It's something extra which is not done in a serial computation, and so it adds to the time that the computer takes. So therefore, machine cycles and resources have to be dedicated to the communication effort. Data which is sent through the network is often packaged, much like you would put a package through the mail with a stamp and, of course, an address and return to sender. This is also done essentially through the network. Every processor should know where something's coming from and where it's sending it to. Generally, a, each processor should know it's going to receive something. If a processor is not expecting a package, if you will, it will not receive it. This is very much unlike our modern mail system where I might receive a package, which I was not expecting. Communication will often require some sort of synchronization. That means each set of communications is synchronized. There's also a thing called asynchronous communication, but this is a little bit less used in computational fluid dynamics. The idea of synchronization is everybody is doing their work. That is, every processor is working on the solver, part of the CFD problem, and then they get to a point where they all communicate the results to everybody else. This is an idea that there's a waiting period. The processor that finishes their work first will have to wait. They'll do nothing until they receive data and send data to the other processors. This next communication cycle, of course, occurs when the slowest processor, of course, finishes its part of the job. Now, some processors might not be faster than others. If they're all the same, that's fine. It could be that just one particular processor has ever slow, more slowly work. This is the idea that we need to balance the workload across all processors. Another important factor to take into account, which is not usually a programmer's problem, but is a hardware problem, is the idea of latency and bandwidth. The latency will be the time it takes to send a byte of data, a zero byte message from point A to point B. And this is commonly expressed in microseconds. You can see your own latency, for example, in your terminal on your computer by using the ping command. If you type in ping, P-I-N-G, with a particular network address, and that network address returns these ping commands, it will give you a latency to a particular server. You can try it out. It's quite fun to try and ping different servers on the internet. There's also bandwidth. Bandwidth is the amount of data that can be sent on a per second basis. I think most people today are familiar with bandwidth because they might view it as the time or download speeds or upload speeds of their particular internet router at home or at work. There's interesting websites where you can go and measure your bandwidth and latency for your own internet network provider. Use Google to find one and try it out. It's pretty entertaining. 
It's the exact same concept, latency and bandwidth, between the high-speed network of particular nodes on, of course, a supercomputer. So it's also true that sending many small me messages can cause additional latency and slower communication. Why is this? Because, of course, the processor, when it's sending messages or receiving them, has to interpret all the headers that tell that data where it's going. Therefore, if one processor is sending data to the another, it's better to send it all as one set of data versus many smaller sets. This will, of course, reduce reduce the communication time and the reduce communication overhead. So good CFD codes or parallelized codes will send the data as basically blocks of heterogeneous data all as one single message. This will be much more efficient. Next there's of course the visibility of the communications. This is more to do with what the programmer sees. When you're creating these codes with a message passing model, you'll often program each communication directive. In other models, they'll be completely invisible to you. For example, the OpenMP code, or library to paralyze serial codes on shared memory machines, this type of communication is often completely invisible to the programmer and user, except for specifying the number of cores to be used, that is processes. The message passing model is much more explicit and then you can see every particular directive and program them. The MPI model, which is the first one, message passing model, is the most popular model, of course, in programming CFD codes, because it can work on heterogeneous distributed memory machines seamlessly and all other types of machines. Another important concept is the idea of synchronous versus asynchronous communication. I'll give you a chance to read through these bullets, but I'll summarize it this way. Synchronous communication means that all processors would wait and send their communication at a particular time. They're all doing it at once and they're all synchronized. Asynchronous communication means that processors will start sending and trying to receive messages as soon as they get to that part of the command in their source code. That is, they will come and finish their particular amount of computational work in the CFD solver and then start sending data and receiving it. They will not wait for other processors to send or receive data. An asynchronous code can run a little bit faster than a synchronous code because, of course, processors never wait. On the other hand, it can be a little bit dangerous and your codes can crash because, of course, your processors might be sending data and the other CPUs will not be listening and wanting to receive it at all. Therefore, the so-called blocking commands and non-blocking commands are introduced. Blocking communication means, of course, that the CPUs will just come to the blocking code in the MPI framework and stop and wait and listen or send and wait for their other processors to say that they're ready to receive. So basically a block in command is a communication step in itself because all the processors are communicating with each other to let everybody know that they're done and waiting for data. There's also all kinds of ways that CPUs might communicate through a high-speed network. They might communicate collectively or point to point or they might have certain orders given based on a numbering scheme. This gets very complicated and it's probably a little bit beyond a CFD class, but you can imagine that if you're in a room full of students and you're passing notes and you want everybody to read the note, there could be multiple notes or a single note that needs to be distributed. How should it be distributed? What's the most efficient way? These types of ideas are excellent analogs to how a high performance computer is working. For example, if one CPU has data that needs to be distributed to all other CPUs, how should that be done? Should it be done by sending that original data packet to every other CPU individually as a single communication command through a loop? Or should it be done through maybe sending the message to CPUs 2 and 3, and then CPUs 2 and 3 and 1 send it to 4, 5, and 6, and then CPUs 1 through 6 send it through, say, CPUs 7 through 12, etc. So the second example might be a little bit more efficient. There's excellent optimal algorithms for communications given the particular computer. Through the programming language, it could be that you let the compiler directive and CPU vendor or the computer vendor choose the optimal mode of communication. Or it could be that the programmer of the CFD code who made it in parallel has chosen their own way themselves and forced the issue to their preference. Slide 8 shows some particular ways that information might be distributed through the computer. In the upper left, we have the idea of a broadcast. Say we have one processor and four other processors that want to receive data. It's a single block of data. It's red. We could simply use an 
broadcast command to broadcast through the high-speed network the single part of data and basically send it through the network and make a copy on all other processes. In CFD1, might this be useful? For example, if a global Mach number must be known as a single Mach number for the CFD code, or perhaps a global speed of sound or ambient speed of sound or other parameter or the total number of grid points, we want every processor and CPU to be aware of that data. And so we would broadcast that to from the single processor, which knows about it initially, which is starting the program, and sending it to all their processors. Another fundamental type of communication might be a scattering methodology. This is where perhaps we have a block of data and a single processor knows about it. And we want to distribute that block of data into four equal parts to four processors. So we would divide it evenly in a linear fashion as red, yellow, green, and blue. We would send, of course, the first block in red to the first processor, yellow to the second, green to the third, and blue to the fourth processor. We might also do the opposite command. Say at the end of our CFD run, we want to write the solution to a file. If we have a serial file program, only we can write files in a serial method from a single processor. This is very typical. At the end of the CFD run, our solution is distributed evenly across all the CPUs. And so we would wanna take the solution that is part of the grid with its particular solution from all CPUs and put it on a single CPU so it can be written to file. This might be shown in the opposite of the scatter, per, scatter algorithm to the gathering communication algorithm down here. Once the gathering is completed and receives the data from all processors, it could write it to file, for instance, or do some work and redistribute it. These are just communications. Finally, we might also do different kinds of commands, like we can do mathematical operations which are defined through the communication approach. For example, if we wanted to add the numbers on each processor and find a total result, it might be one, three, five, seven. And we take these and the processor receives one, three, five, and seven, and it adds them up and of course it gets 16. So that's seven plus five is 12, plus three is 15, plus one is 16. That makes sense. When might this be done in CFD? For example, what if we wanted to know the total mass in the domain? Well, the mass in processor one might be one, three, five, and seven. This is all added, and of course we might get something like 16 kilograms. We could then, of course, divide by the total volume to get the total or average density in the domain. So basically in CFD, we usually divide the, the volume of the fluid spatially, and so we can evenly distribute the data, that is the field variables, across all the processors themselves. These are all one-point communications. There's nothing to be said or wrong with having, say, processor one communicating with processor three or two of four or four of one, etc. In these cases, we're only communicating to like a main processor, processor zero. There's whole classes and books written on how these communication methods work. I suggest picking one up and just leafing through it. It's pretty entertaining. And you'll see these types of algorithms, which of course are created. We must be very efficient communicators if we want CFT to work well. And so, very often, the programmers will have a choice with regard to the factors that can affect communication performance. Only a few will be mentioned here. We might ask which type of model will be used, and there's many types of models which are a little bit beyond the scope of the class. I might mention one, that one is called the Message Passing Interface. This is developed by a consortium of universities and government agencies internationally, and also, especially so, the United States. This is a general library which can be used to take serial programs and make them into parallel programs. Often the network that the parallel programs are running on has a lot of overhead and complexity themselves, and there's certain analysis tools to examine these. Here's one screenshot from a particular parallelization communication overhead and complexity map. This is done for the simple program that prints Hello World. Many of you who've learned to program using C or Fortran in tradition we have always made our first program Hello World. We can also take the easy and simple Hello World program, which simply prints Hello World to the computer screen, and parallelize it. We would parallelize it by asking, say, every processor, say 10 processors on a parallel system, to print out Hello World. For example, Hello World, I'm processor one. Hello World, I'm processor seven. It's rather cute. Nonetheless, we can analyze the communication network for that particular Hello World problem. It's shown in this complicated flowchart, and you can see how very difficult and complicated it becomes.
The actual program itself written in parallel is written very small in the upper left figure. If you want, you can download these types of simple programs for government agencies and try them out on your own computer. For example, if you have a computer with two cores or two processors or whatever, you can set the number of processors to maybe two or three and compile and run it. On your screen, you should see three or two or three printouts of Hello World and their processor IDs. This is the most basic parallel program and what most people do when they start out. When you're designing programs, you'll have to think about load balancing. And the objective of load balancing is that all processors should have a load that is proper for their capacity. So if all our CPUs have the same specs, if they're all the same model, for instance, load balancing isn't a problem as long as we give an equal amount of work to every processor. It's very often that larger systems might have different sets and different models of processors that have different speeds and different cores and different capabilities. And so it'll be up to the user to try and equally balance the CFD problem or other parallel problem across, equally across all these processors. This is a very difficult task in itself. And thankfully, for large systems, most of the nodes and cores and processors and all the disks and network are equally in the same models, so it's not that big of a deal. For more difficult problems, it could be that we have a heterogeneous computer. It could be that we have a network and computers and they're all different models. They could even have Macs and Windows and Linux computers on a network. And it is very much possible, and there's programs out there, to evenly distribute the load based on each computer's particular performance. For example, these programs are done automatically using performance analysis tools. In the figure in the bottom, we might have four particular um, tasks distributed across four uh, computers. In this case, task number two on the third computer is taking up all the time. And if they're synchronized and communicating, the other computers, one, two, and four, would have to wait for three to finish. It would be much more um, reasonable to try and distribute the load from 2 onto zero, 1, 2, and 4, just to balance it out. This is done automatically, but it can be completely avoided with a high-quality system, which of course has a homogeneous computing environment. Another important thing to look at when distributing, excuse me, when designing parallel codes, of course, is the input and output. Now, many file systems are serial in nature, and only one processor can write to a file at once from its own local memory. In this case, the single processor would have to get in its own local memory the data from all other processors. If you have thousands of processors and hundreds of nodes, this is a lot of communication because it has to write the whole CFD solution and send it through the network to one processor. A single processor or node is unlikely to hold the entire problem, especially for large problems. This is why parallel file systems have really come into play. A single file can appear on a hard drive on the system or a distribution of hard drives, and all the processors and all the nodes can be writing to that particular file at once. In fact, the files are written and distributed across this hard drives across the network of the cluster itself. That's quite amazing. So when you're designing a parallel code, you're going to have to understand if you have a parallel operating system or not. And there's even complicated libraries that can be linked in with your code to write files in parallel. This can also be done sometimes automatically through certain compilers on certain systems. So it's a lot of work and for computer scientists to design all this so it's easy for people writing CFD codes to have this capability. There's a few rules of thumb when creating input output for CFD codes or just codes in general. Remember, reading or writing RAM is an inexpensive and non-time consuming operation compared to reading and writing files to a hard drive. So we always wish to reduce the a number of writes and reads to our hard drive as much as possible. If we have access to a parallel file system, we absolutely should be using it. It will speed up our codes tremendously. A very, very large amount of time in CFD is spent reading and writing the solution files and restart files. In the solvers you're using in this class, you'll be able to change the frequency of reading and writing the restart files. You'll see if you read or re write your restart file, say every 10 iterations versus 100, you'll have a significant performance cost in your simulation. This might cost you a lot of time when running on a large system. On the other hand, the more frequent you write your restart, 
files, which can be used to restart your simulation in case it crashes, for instance, or the computer crashes, which can happen more often than we want in parallel systems. Then you'll be able to restart the simulation from the last restart file and, of course, save time. So it's a balance you'll have to make. From a programming perspective, of course, this is a very important part of the program that should be optimized as much as possible. Let's now turn our attention to designing parallel programs, and we'll show some examples. The first might be some array processing. Say we have a two-dimensional array, and we, it's running in serial. Now, for each i and j location of the array, we have some function. It's an arbitrary function. Let's call that function fcm, and we want to assign a at index ij to the function from ij. And it's really a serial program. And you can see that a, i, j does not depend on, say, other neighbors of i and j, like i plus 1 or i minus 1. That's good. And then we want to do this operation on every element in this array. So we would loop over or do loops in programming, do loops, over every element j and i. In this particular little Fortran snippet, you can see that we are looping for j equals 1 to n and i equals 1 to n, where n is a large integer that corresponds to the number of columns and rows in this array. So for every i and j, we will assign a value to a from the function i and j. So if this is our program which we want to parallelize, let's think about some questions to ask first. One, is this problem able to be parallelized? Likely yes, because it's embarrassingly serial. In fact, Remember, i and j don't depend on any other value. a doesn't depend on any other value of a, and of course the function doesn't change as we evaluate this loop. And so you can imagine just looking at it, we might be able to send this command to say n by n processors and have it done in an embarrassingly parallel fashion. How would we partition this problem? Say we only have four processors to work with. How do we divide up the work equally among four processors? One naive way would just take n divided by four. Is communication needed? Do we need to communicate the results as this is run to different processors? Are there any data dependencies? That means, does the data in the algorithm depend on other types of data? Do we need to synchronize the run in some way? Do we know, need to be concerned about load balancing? Almost always, yes. You'll see the answers to these questions in this particular example. You'll see that the calculation of the elements is completely independent of one another. This means we can find an embarrassingly parallel solution and implementation. We can evenly distribute and have load balancing across the nodes as long as n is even and we divide by an even number of processors. We can always have one or more or one less particular row if we divide the processors, if we have an odd number of n and an even number of processors, for instance. Let's say we have four processors uh, for the sake of simplicity, or maybe n processors or tasks. Then we would distribute the task of this array through, say, task 1, task 2, task 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, et cetera, all the way up to task n. In this case, we divide each particular set into four particular columns. We could have any number we wish, of course. Um, if we only have two processors and we have, say, n equals 200, each one would have 100. Very simple. We have an equal amount of work, so we don't have to worry about uh, load balancing if we have the same type of CPUs across the board. And there's really likely no type of communication really needed if we have a shared memory machine. If we have a distributed memory machine, we do have to send this data across the network to each node to be worked on. If we have a shared memory machine, we don't have to distribute or send the memory anywhere. Let's assume that we're working on shared memory machines with multiple processors. So now, how do we change our serial code from the original Fortran code? So here's the serial code, and here is, of course, the parallelized code. You can see that the second, third, fourth, and fifth lines are exactly the same. The changes are shown in red. Now, before in a serial code, only one processor runs this particular lines of code. Now, all tasks, one through n, run this set of code. They're all running the exact same code. But you'll see the only difference is now each processor is running over the loop j from my start to my end. For task 1, my start would be equal to 1 and my end would be equal to 4. For task 4, excuse me, for task 2, my start would be 5 and my end, which is another integer, would be equal to 8. On the right is the equivalent code written in essentially C, another programming language. 
So anyway, you can see how simple this is. All we have to do to change it to a parallel code is change the indices. And of course, when the parallel run runs, each processor will have to ascertain through communication or through its own algorithm what my start and my end are. A simple way would be task one would say, hey, I'm task one, so my indices are, for example, one through four based on the total number of n. You would see that every processor would also need to know its individual values of n and my start and my end. That's pretty simple to do. Let's look at another famous example, which is calculating pi through a statistical approach. So look on the right. We have a box with lengths 2r on each side, and a radius of a circle fits perfectly in it with radius r. Now, for mathematics, we know that the area of the square is going to be 4r squared. We know that the area of the circle is going to be pi r squared. If we take the ratio and eliminate r, of course, from these two terms, we can solve and have a value for pi. Pi will be 4 times the area of the circle divided by the area of the square. So how do we ascertain these particular areas through statistical approach? Well, it's like a dartboard. If we take a dartboard and put a square around it, we can randomly throw darts at it. And if we count up the number of darts or points randomly placed in the circle and the total number of points, and of course, in the square, which is also contained in the circle, we can find these particular statistical quantities and divide them through and approximate, of course, pi through its multiplication of four. So what's the algorithm from the dartboard analogy? We would inscribe a circle within a square, which we've already done. Then we would randomly generate points in the square. We would then determine the number of points in the square that are also in the circle. We would then seek r as the number of points in the circle divided by the number of points in the square. Then, of course, like I've just shown on the lower right, pi will be going as 4r. So, obviously, the more points that are generated, the better approximation of pi we would have. This is actually a fun example. We would never really do this to find pi on a computer in a um, you know, mathematically rigorous way. Typically, pi is a constant which is hard-coded in the computer from, of course, theory. Or it could be done through series expansions. There's many different ways to program pi. In a CFD code, perhaps, if we want to use pi, we would just call the constant pi for the math library, which is hard-coded. Nonetheless, let's look at a serial program, a serial program to calculate pi statistically of this fashion. Let's say we have the number of points as 10,000. So we've thrown 10,000 darts. And initially, the number of darts within the circle will be zero. We then loop over the number of points from j, which is a counting ver integer variable from one to the number of points. Now we want, and this is pseudocode, mind you, we will generate two random numbers between zero and one. So we call our random number generator. We call two random numbers. Our random numbers might be like 0.4 and 0.98. Another set might be, say, 0.15 and 0.43. We are getting these sets. And for each set, we'll set the x coordinate equal to the first random number and the y coordinate equal to the second random number. And we're doing this over these loops, mind you, from j equals 1 to 10,000. And of course, if we increase 10,000 higher, we'll get a better approximation. And now we have a logical statement. If the x coordinate and y coordinate lies inside the circle, then we'll say the circle count is incremented we'll say circle count is incremented by one. For example, in the first iteration, if we generate a random point that falls within the circle, we will increase the number of points within the circle by one. Of course, if the point, the random point is say up here where my cursor is, then it will be outside the circle and this if statement is not true and we won't increment our circle counter. So the circle counter might be 10,000 or zero. It's very unlikely. It's more likely that as if we have a truly random number generator that has the correct statistical properties of an even distribution from 0 to 1, that we will approach pi through the formula after the loop finishes of 4 times the circle count divided by the number of points, which of course is shown down here in the formula on the right, essentially, from the area to the number of points in the circle. Neat. You can actually try the serial program yourself very simply in MATLAB or Fortran or C. Prefer Fortran, of course. Now, say we want to parallelize this program. It's easy to parallelize, but harder previously. You might look at this program and ask all the same questions we had previously in the previous problem about synchronization, 
communication, blocking, can it be parallelized at all, must be run in serial. But you can imagine now that we could say have, instead of one dart player throwing 10,000 darts, we could have two dart players throwing 5,000, and then saying, hey, did my dart land in the circle or not, and increment their own counter. The counter would then be given to the other, or perhaps master dart player, and they would add them up and do the final mathematical operation. Let's see how that works in a parallel fashion. On the left is, once again, our pseudocode. And this is written text is the original code, and the red text is we added or changed from the original serial code. So you can flip back and forth and see the differences. We still assign 10,000 points. We still set a circle count to zero. Now, all processors are essentially running this code. Now, we will divide our processors into, say, workers or masters, master processor and worker processor. This is a very old terminology. Today, many people just say processor zero or integer processor. Now look at the loop. The loop is almost the same, except now we're looping from j equals one to some particular number. The number is now different because we said p will be the number of tasks, that's the number of processors, and num will be the number of points, that is, which is still 10,000 divided by p. So for example, if we have two processors, each one will have a num value of 5,000, and they're looping over their own set of work from j equals 1 to num. In this case, all processors are performing this operation, but only from j equals 1 to n, and they all have their local value of memory of circle count 0. And so circle count will be different on processors 0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4. After all processors complete this segment of code, they'll ask themselves, am I processor 0? Am I the master processor? If they are, then of course they'll receive from the workers their circle counts. Then it'll compute pi, just like we previously did here with 4 pi count over n points. If they're workers, they'll send their circle count data to the master processor. So at the end of the simulation, excuse me, at the end of this code, every processor will have its own unique circle count. The master or processor zero will receive that circle count from every other processor. And then of course, it will calculate pi based on the total number of circle counts. And then it'll return it to the user who ran the program and the program will end. So this is an idea where there's only a gather operation. It's gathering unique circle count data from visually in the reduction command in the lower right of slide eight. Let's now look at another example, the heat equation. We studied and looked at the heat equation and its solutions in the beginning of this class in our mathematical review. Remember the heat equation in this case might be seen as a Laplace equation if it's a steady heat conduction problem. Once again, let's look at a two dimensional domain. This is showing one particular solution, actually. Nonetheless, we divide our domain into little volumes and do a finite difference approach. So we discretize our domain in the x and y direction, and we have grid points and lines. We want to find the solution to the heat equation on this problem. So this is a little bit more complicated. Like before, we would discretize the equation and write, perhaps, an explicit Euler type um, method to find a solution everywhere and march it in time. So we've discretized our approach, and let's say our unknown variable is u. In perhaps each stencil, we can rewrite our equation this way on the left. This is the discretized form of the equation. And it'll be u of xy, that's the u at the value of xy equals the old value of uxy plus a constant in c, x and cy plus the finite differences. You can see this is a second order central finite difference. You should be able to recognize these now after our numerical methods classes. If you don't recall that, I suggest going back and watching one of those videos or reviewing your notes, which are distributed to class handouts, of course. We can graph this on the right, lower right. For example, we have an x and y axis. In the middle, we have our new value, uxy, and we have the u, old value, uxy. We show there's neighboring, of course, cells or nodes. At, for example, u of x plus 1 and y, u of x minus 1 and y, u of x, y minus 1, and u of x, y plus 1. You can see that the solution at every grid point depends on its neighbors. That's fine in a serial program, but if we distribute our memory and problem across different processors, then of course they'll have to communicate because it could be that the value of u, x minus 1 is on a different processor and set of memory 
or even completely different computer than the value of say u of x, y, and u of x, y plus one. And so if we divide this problem into four parts, we might have communication along particular lines or, or neighbors of these particular divisions of the computational domain. This happens all the time in CFD and is why the heat example is always shown. Let's write a, a serial code that solves the heat equation. Here we have one loop from integer iy from 2 to ny minus 1 and another loop of ix from 2 to nx minus 1. And so we have an embedded do loop. That is, we're looping over all values from 2 to ny and 2 to nx. nx is the number of grid points in the x direction and y is the number of grid points in the y direction. Why don't we loop from 1 to nx or ny, for example? Because we have direct loop boundary conditions. So we are specifying the value of u on the boundaries. And so we would never update the solution on the boundaries because we specify the solution there. You do not change the solution where you already know it, of course which in this case is the direct loop boundary condition. So we're finding the solution interior to the domain. In, of course, the inside of these two loops, looping over all the grid points in the x and y direction, we will put in our discretized form. So we'll say u2, which is the new solution here, equals u1, the old solution, plus our discretized forms. So you can see u1, this is the old solution, will be ix plus 1, with iy, that corresponds to the grid point to the right of the central part of the stencil. Let's look at another example. We have minus two u1 of ix iy. That's the old solution in the middle. A third example, u of one, that's the old solution u1, at ix and iy plus one, that's this location here. So you see, we've taken our heat equation, we've discretized it, and we've put it in a numerical algorithm with an explicit Euler method with direct lip boundary conditions to solve it. So, this is all running in serial, and of course, it will give us a solution if we let iterate from, say, u1 to u2, and after the iteration, we set u2 to equal u1, and we rerun this part of the code. So this is the part of the code that we wish to parallelize, because of course, that's where most of the work is being done. So there's obviously a lot more challenges to this particular task because now communication and synchronization is required. That is, if we divide our problem into four parts or n parts, say then task zero will have to communicate with task one, task two with three, etc., all the way to n minus one to n communications. Now you can see task zero will never have to communicate directly in the core part of the solver with say task seven or 10 or n because they don't share neighboring nodes. This is exactly the same in CFD. Typically, only neighboring decompositions in the domain have to communicate with each other. Let's look at the particular code and its modifications to run this heat equation in parallel using a shared memory architecture. It is much more complicated than architecture with, with non-shared memory. So first thing to do is find out if each processor is the master processor or worker processor. If it's a master processor, we will initialize the particular array and we'll send each worker starting with its particular information in subarray and it'll be receive the results from each other worker. Now the code will run and only one processor will be processor zero. That's often called the master processor or boss processor. If your processor one through n, for example, you'll be a worker processor and they'll run this part of the code. So the if statement says, if I'm the master, I'll do this, else I'm a worker and I'll do that. So task zero runs this code, task one through n runs this part of the code. So the master or processor zero will initialize the computational array in memory, and it'll send each worker the particular initial conditions, and it will send each worker one through n its particular subarray. For this example, worker, which is task or processor one, will receive its indices for it to work on an array, which goes from five to, of course, eight. This is done for every other processor. Now, the processors are gonna do the computational work. Every processor can simply run a number of time steps from one to n steps. So we are now iterating from iteration one at time one to a number of time steps. And all processors will update their own time. Then they will send their neighbors, for example, task one will send data to task two and task zero, their border data, which represents the column on the borders of say task one. Task zero and three will then receive that data. Then the neighboring processors 
for task one, for example, would receive the column four from task zero and column nine from task two. Then it would update its solution array and of course perform the iteration. They would all do this in integer n steps times, which is specified by the user. That's just like the iteration count in the CFD code. It would then send all the results from all their specific arrays to the master or processor zero processor to put it in a single array, which can then be written to disk. So this can be improved in many ways. First, it could have a parallel file system, and that way they can all write and read data on their own from a master file. They don't need to have a processor zero read a file and distribute it like in this approach. It could also be that in this particular case, processor zero is doing no work except sending and receiving data and waiting for the result. Truly, it can be improved by having processor zero be also doing work equally with all other processors. This is typically what's happening in a contemporary CFD code. Let's look at one more equation. And in our mathematical review, we looked at the wave equation very carefully. We'll look at a one-dimensional linear wave equation now. Say we want to solve this with an explicit Euler type method. We would need to, of course, discretize our spatial, spatial term with central difference and discretize our temporal term to be an explicit Euler term. We then solve for, say, the variable a, let's say our unknown variable is a governed by the wave equation. So we'll say a at index i and time t plus one, so it's one dimensional, we only have one index i, and we have a time step t, both integers, will be equal to two times a of i t minus a of t minus one plus a speed of sound times a of i minus 1t minus 2a of it plus a of i plus 1t. Look at the terms. You can see that this term here, c times these discretized terms, that's your spatial discretization. These terms here are the result of solving the explicit Euler formulation and solving for time of t plus 1. You'll notice everything on the right hand side is a function of time t and everything on the left is time t plus 1, so it's an explicit method. You'll also note that i is the index at one particular point. For example, where my cursor is, this might be point i, and neighboring points are i plus one and i minus one. We might also have some particular boundary conditions. Say we fix the boundary condition at i equals zero at, say, zero. So we have a direct boundary condition. The other boundary conditions, of course, at higher values, might be Newman, mixed, or direct -lit. Let's solve this in parallel. It should be very easy to write a serial program for this, Simple, simply with a loop over space and time and updating the solutions just like we did in the heat equation. But now we're in one dimensional and advancing in time. Let's look at the parallel code for this case on the right. First, we would discretize the domain from say i equals one to n. And of course, then we divide the domain by say the number of tasks. In the upper right, you show a figure of this. We have the wave, its discretization with points known variables a, and we split into four parts. Then, of course, we know that we have a spatial discretization scheme which overlaps for the particular wave equation. This is the overlap region, so you know that, say, this processor will have to communicate with the yellow one, the yellow with the green, and the green with the purple. So the first task in the code will be to try and find out the number of tasks and identify their task numbers. We'll identify the left and right numbers for each particular process or task. For example, every task has its own unique ID. We'll call that my task ID. So if it's processor one, it's my task ID would be, say, zero. If it's processor eight, then my task ID would be, of course, seven. Then it's left and right numbers would be, it's my task ID is minus one and plus one. So if, for example, if I'm task eight, my processor ID to my left would be seven, and my right number would be right. You can see how this is done in three dimensions, but we're doing in one for simplicity. Anyway, we find the neighbor tasks, and of course, they'll know which their neighbors are through a simple algorithm. Now, the master processor will initialize the or solution array and initialize the initial condition and boundary conditions, and it'll send this data to all the other processors. All the other processors will then receive the data. Then we'll iterate and march in time using our algorithm. So in this case, unlike the previous one, processor zero will help with the solution approach, which is good. That way it's not sitting around for days at a time waiting for the solution from the workers. It will, every processor will send first data to the left and then, of course, to the right, and every processor will receive data from the left and right. This will be done for both the left and right pair neighbors. 
So this is the communication steps, which are in red because they're not normally in the serial code. Now, the exact same serial equivalent code will be used. We'll go from i equals 1 to the number of points in a domain, that's the spatial number of indices, and we'll update all the values according to the discretized algorithm or the wave equation here on slide 18. You can see then this is shown here in these um, particular pseudocodes, and that's fine. After that's done, we do an in dupe loop and go from time equals 1 to 2, etc., and repeat this exact same process all the way up to the number of steps. You're going to have to read through this very carefully and think about each step to understand how the parallelization is performed, to fully understand it. At the end, of course, if processor 0 will try and receive the solution from all other processors, and then I'll write the data to file. In this if statement, if it's not processor 0, it's say processor 1 through processor, say, my ID minus 1, then it'll send the results to the master, and they'll be done. And of course, we have an in-program statement. It's that simple. Today, we looked at just a few important ideas of programming and implementing codes in parallel. You can see that parallelizing a full CFD code is extremely complicated. It contains many loops and logical statements and types of boundary emissions. All this must be distributed completely and evenly through a heterogeneous computer system. Thankfully, there's entire fields and people looking at parallelizations. And it's really fun to try and parallelize your own codes, especially with a particular heat or wave equation, as an example to learn how to do it. I suggest trying to do it with the so-called OpenMP language in C or Fortran, or MPI if you're feeling more advanced in um, C or Fortran. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.